Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. It's easy to allow symbols and ideas from outside the Bible to shape our understanding of the text. In contrast, serious biblical students set aside extra biblical influences so that only Scripture can interpret Scripture. In late antiquity, this tension was felt in the divergent schools of Antioch and Alexandria. While metaphor and allegory are present in both traditions, the Antiochians looked to the Bible as their primary source, foregoing Alexandria's affinity for Hellenistic philosophy. In this week's episode, Richard and I discuss the problem of biblical interpretation and the metaphor of the empty tomb in Mark chapter 16. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 67 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Father, on Sunday, you were preaching about Mark chapter 16. And in your sermon, you talked about the tomb and the way that the tomb is carved out. You compared that to the carving out of the idols and the way that the Romans would create idols made of stone. And I was wondering if you could talk more about this, because sometimes some people may hear our interpretations and wonder if this is a stretch or something like this. So I thought it would be good for us to talk about how we interpret, because we talk a lot about storyline, we talk a lot about the story, but there is a way that we have to then come to an understanding of this in order to live this out. In the early church, you had two schools of biblical exegesis, the Antiochian school, which is the school that we aspire to in our work, and the school of Alexandria in Egypt. So you had Syrian biblical scholarship and Egyptian biblical scholarship, for lack of a better description. And in the case of the Antiochian school, you have this tradition that focuses on the text of the Bible itself, not only as the primary source or the primary data, but the only source And aside from dealing with the Bible as the primary data and taking the words on the page seriously, I would say taking them literally, but not in the way that we talk about it when we critique fundamentalism. I mean, literally in the way that a scientist looks at data and limits his or her scope to what the data actually is. They don't go beyond that scope. This is what the Antiochian school tries to do. It's a school of literary science, if you will. Within that school, once you understand what the data is, you are allowed to look at historical context because you want to know why the writer is writing. To whom are they writing? What are the circumstances that might lead to certain symbols or that might help us understand certain symbols? So within the Antiochian school, you do have metaphor. You do have allegory. Sometimes people will compare Antioch and Alexandria and say, well, the problem with the Alexandrians is it was all allegory and metaphor, and the Antiochians were scientists who were interested in history and literary criticism. This is a gross oversimplification of the two schools. And I think it's actually incorrect to say that metaphor and allegory were the domain of Alexandria. In the Antiochian school, you could look at the canonical text as a narrative and see connections between symbols and metaphors in one part of the story with symbols and metaphors in other parts of the story. The classic is the typological reading. You're familiar with that in the Antiochian tradition. Adam was a type of Christ and so forth. But in the Alexandrian school, when they use allegory and metaphor, the difference is that they look outside of the text. So, for example, an Alexandrian might say, here, Jesus represents Harry Potter. Well, this is nonsense. I mean, again, this is a gross oversimplification. So if you're interested in classical exegesis, I encourage our listeners to actually go to the library and study the schools. Don't take my word for it. Do your own analysis. 
But to say that here Jesus is saying what Parmenides said, or here Moses represents Aristotle. When you do this, when you just simply reach out into whatever source you want and start mixing symbols together and imposing allegory on the text. This, to me, is how I understand the Alexandrian school and the difference between the two schools. So when I talk about the temple and its connection to Gentilic idolatry, I'm talking about themes in the biblical canon. I'm not pulling from other traditions. You know how in technology they talk about the internet and then at your company you have an intranet? It's the same in biblical studies. There's intertextual readings, which look outside of the Bible to other texts in order to interpret the Bible. You could say that that's kind of an Alexandrian approach. And then there's the intratextual, which means you stay within the bounds of the scope of the text you're studying. So you could say the Antiochians were intratextual, meaning if I want to talk about how Jesus functions here, it's okay to go back and study how Adam functioned in Genesis, but it's not okay to go study Parmenides and then come up with some theology that connects Hellenistic notions of the unity of creation with Genesis. I mean, it's silly because they're two different fields of study, two different schools, two schools that I would argue that are completely in opposition to each other. I mean, this is the problem with Gnostic literature in late antiquity. As Tertullian said, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? I love this saying. I think it's very astute and very correct. So again, when I talk about the tomb, I'm using symbols and themes, and I'm actually looking at the storyline in the canonical Bible. So it sounds like to me also you're saying that one of the problems with the Alexandrian school is that for interpretation, one of the keys of interpretation they use is... Hellenistic philosophy, which of course yes. we know that the problem with that, whereas the Antiochian school, as you're describing it, uses the text itself as the key to interpretation. You can't say whatever you want about Adam and Jesus. You can't start making all these cool connections that seem interesting to you because they fit nicely together. You have to study Genesis as Genesis, a complete unit of the Bible, and understand Genesis in terms of of the concrete literal data presented in Genesis, then you have to do the same with the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of John. And once you understand each text as its own unit, you can then take a step back as someone who's knowledgeable in the empirical data of the text and start to understand how the writer of Mark, because Mark is a later text, how the writer of Mark is using symbols from Genesis. So there's a science to it. You just can't say whatever the heck you want. I remember when I would teach religion, they would say, well, you know, everyone has their own opinion. Everyone has their own interpretation. So how can you say that one interpretation is better than the other? And I say, any interpretation is a possible interpretation, but what's the best interpretation? And the way that you tell if it's the best interpretation is does it fit with the other data within the text. Even Protestants are not really sola scriptura because if you're going to do real sola scriptura, whenever you make an interpretation of a text, it has to match with every other text within the book. Correct. Anytime you want an interpretation, you have to go back and check the entire thing. If it contradicts it in one spot, you have to redo your interpretation. You can't say sola scriptura and then say my personal experience of Jesus. It's not possible. Then you're not sola scriptura. Then you're just full of baloney. Because then you want to take something you invented in your mind and impose it on the text. So we're back at square one. Exactly. The precise problem is that we want to impose this on the text. Now, one of the problems we always run into is there's always a gap. There's always a gap between this book, which is, as we say, a unit, which is self-contained, which is a storyline. But we want it to function in a different way than Moby Dick. Moby Dick, we read it, it's nice, and then we put it back on the shelf. We're not doing a weekly podcast about Moby Dick. We're doing a podcast because there's something about the Bible that's special and that it's canonical and that it's a way to order our lives. Right. It's a teaching, about not how just to a book. It, yeah, it's a teaching about how to live. It's not simply a book. So making the leap from there's a story about a bunch of people. One of those people happens to be named Jesus, and there's a couple Marys and a Salome, and there's all these other folks in the story, 
But there is a Mark, but there is no Richard in the story. So what does this have to do with me? This is always the gap that we're going to have to bridge. So everyone that reads the Bible is going to have to interpret it. In this way, my students were correct. Everyone has to interpret it. Now, one can have an incorrect interpretation, and one can have a correct interpretation, and one can have a more correct or more incorrect interpretation. And I believe that the way that we can judge a correct interpretation from an incorrect interpretation is what I just said. You have to compare it to other things throughout Scripture. Now, some people say it's impossible to live your life according to Scripture because there are contradictions. We have four Gospels. Some of the details are not consistent. How are you supposed to order your life according to a book that is not even consistent internally? You know, an atheist, an anti-biblicist would make this statement. And so that's something that we have to deal with. There are things that are, we would say, seeming contradictions, whereas outsiders would say obvious contradictions, clear interpretations. So what do we do in order to get that to work? This is the job of interpretation, and this is where we have to be very careful about the tools we use and the limits that we set on our use of those tools. And that's, I think, what we've been building up over the course of these many months through our podcast is to demonstrate how we use our tools. Absolutely. So our listeners can understand what are the sorts of tools that we can use. And I love that we have the metaphor today of the tomb hewn from the rock, the tools that we use in order to do something with it. Now, hewing the tomb, we're relating to idolatry. So how do we make sure that when we interpret, we're not simply creating an idol. I think it's very simple. And I'll answer you first with a metaphoric statement. When you carve a tomb out of stone, when you carve something out of the rock, which is a technical terminology in scripture, you are making something with your own hands. Your implements and the materials that you're using are things that you handle and shape yourself. I think if you submit to the data of scripture, meaning you don't put your own ideas but you struggle with the actual data and you are ruthless, as a scientist should be, ruthless about limiting your scope to the data and about making sure that the way you piece the data together conforms to the way it's laid out as a source material. Then I think within the bounds of scriptural metaphor, you are allowing God to construct the temple not made by human hands which is a temple of hearers. I mean, when Paul says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't mean that, as we critiqued last week, that you should have an emotional experience when you walk into church and know that God is inside of you, blah, 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 because if that's what you think, then you're just a bloody Hellenist, and you should go back in time and commune with Parmenides because you think you're God and part of some giant monad. That's not what Paul is saying. What he's saying is that the temple made of stone is deaf, dumb, and dead, just like a statue of Apollo. The church on the corner next to your bar in southeast Minneapolis is a hunk of stone and wood, and it'll be gone, and it says nothing, and it stands for nothing. It's just an inanimate object. But according to Paul, if you preach the word in a way that submits to the word, what happens is that God's instruction gathers the people, the ecclesia to Theu, gathers the people together to form a temple made of flesh and blood. Now, who created human beings? The Lord of hosts, which means that if you submit to his instruction, you are the work of his hands. That's the temple which we serve. It's the temple of God's people called together by his teaching for the sake of those who rejected the call. So, I mean, we could go on talking about what that really is. I mean, the Bible is the temple. It is the reality that produces the reality in us. I think, though, to your point, it gets to the heart of what Scripture is. Scripture is a text that deconstructs what men build so that all you're left with is its instruction. And I'm going to pick up on a couple of words you mentioned, Father, a minute ago, which are struggle and ruthless. Mm. And I think that this answers a big question that we have in the world, which is many people who have a pull of whatever they want to call religiosity, spirituality, whatever they want to call, but they don't want to be fundamentalists. How can we be followers of Scripture and not be fundamentalist? And 
fundamentalists, from my own experience, are completely unbending in their interpretation of the Bible or of the Quran or of whatever. This is what the fundamentalist is, is ultimately unbending. They do not struggle with interpretation. They are not ruthless in their interpretation. They're afraid of contradiction. They want everything to be neat and clean. It's amazing to me. I systematically put contradictory ideas in my preaching because scripture does so systematically. Because if you can't accept contradiction, you're a fundamentalist. Because the inability to accept contradictory metaphors and symbols and statements proves mathematically that you are not willing to accept the complexity of the universe around you. And once you reject that complexity and you try, as you always say, to put everything in neat, tidy categories that you can check off, I mean, what's his name? Uh, Chesterton calls this the definition of insanity, but we call it fundamentalism. It's burying your head in the sand. And I mean, look, Richard, I think that if we do have a catastrophic environmental disaster in the modern world, There's only two groups to blame, clergy and English professors. Because somewhere along the line, everyone decided that anyone could say whatever they wanted about literature. And once they decided that, people started saying that about everything. And we've gotten to a point in the new dark age, which is where we live today, that I can confront someone with a fact and they'll deny it. It's an empirical fact that vaccines reduce fatalities on apocalyptic scales. Yet people are arguing that possibly there's a connection and blah, blah, blah. There is a majority interpretation of the data by experts that the Industrial Revolution has changed the path of the planet's evolution and that we are wrecking creation. So the thing is, Could there be other interpretations? Of course. Could there be other interpretations of biology than evolution? Of course. But right now, these are the best interpretations of the data we have. And if your reason for denying it is the same reason you gave in your college English class when you came up with some cockamamie interpretation of a poem that has nothing to do with what the author said but made you feel good, if that's how we're approaching data, it's not simply a matter of the damage that it does to the wisdom tradition such as the Bible. It's about what it does to civilization. It's a very serious matter. And I think it's the responsibility of the clergy to go back to our roots as people who carried the torch for knowledge and wisdom and scientific analysis of the data. Religion is not about how you feel. It's about how you think and what you live by. And the important part is to be ruthless in this search. Always be checking. Always be doubting. Scripture is constantly trying to make you doubt. You know, a lot of times one could come up with a conclusion from what we say that church is malarkey, that religion is malarkey, and that sort of thing. So leave it. Leave it behind. Flee from it. But what scripture is saying is not that church is malarkey, religion is malarkey. Well, it does, but not exclusively. It says everything is malarkey. It says whatever you go and you find, once you leave, it's going to be more malarkey. So the only solution is to keep coming back to scripture And so if church is not exclusively dedicated to teaching scripture and to teaching the way that it undermines human institution and human construct, then it's going to become the human construct and be lauding its own longevity and its ability to outlast other institutions and blah, 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 just like Caesar. Or you're going to go to another institution. You're going to go to a political party or you're going to go to uh, whatever. You're going to find something else. I have only two critiques of Martin Luther. Two critiques. Number one, that because he could not figure out how James fit the rest of the New Testament canon, he decided to throw it out. Once he did that, he undermined his whole thing about sola scriptura. It's unacceptable. He didn't submit to the full body of data. That's number one. Number two, whatever he passed on to his spiritual children— 
they actually violated what you're saying, this basic premise of the anti-idolatry school, that just because you recognize a flaw in the Roman Catholic Church doesn't mean that you are a god who can establish another church. You have no right. Because the problem with your assumption in establishing another church is that you can do something better than what your parents did. And this is classical idolatry. Because every church that has been established of any denomination or group anywhere always fails because it is made up of human beings. It is a human institution. And the fault in that idea is that it's not submitting to Scripture. because right. You're could, looking to something else to save you. If you go and you look at Scripture, you'll see in bright, shiny terms how tarnished and awful your ideas are going to be and where the, how they're going to end up. Solomon, did he improve on David? No. Did Abel, <laughs> did, no. Did, Cain, did Cain improve on Adam? Did Noah's children improve on him? This is the American neurosis. This is our neurosis. We all think we can be better than our parents and we actually have enshrined it as a value. And maybe it comes from our history of sectarianism within Christianity. There's something wrong with this church. I'm gonna start my own and make it better. There's something wrong with my parents. I'm going to be a better parent than my parents and raise my kids differently. There's something wrong with the old country, so we're going to build something better than the old country. But it's a facade. It's a fallacy. It's vanity. It's a lie because, as I say in my book, we all have the same DNA. You cannot outrun or outdo your parents. And the more you try, the more likely you are not just to stumble as they did, but to fall harder because you are delusional. Because you're not accepting the truth of your existence and your condition as a human. And once you don't accept that truth, then you're blind. And as the historians say, you're likely to repeat history. Now, you can see this happen in New England, for example, in the U.S. Once you drive through New England and you go to Canaan and you go to Bethlehem and you go to Jerusalem and you go through Antioch and all these places in New England. Now, those people who are setting it up they said, we're interpreting scripture. We're going to eliminate all the people who are here, and we're going to set up uh, Israel here, because obviously in England they weren't able to do it. So we're going to set it up here. Now, this is an interpretation. I, I have to say it's an interpretation. But the reason why it ended up the way that it ended up is because it was not consistent. Because as soon as Israel set this up, in scripture, the people of Israel set this up in scripture, it all fell apart because the people drifted away. Now, if you're going to submit this interpretation, we're going to set up a new Israel in this new world, fine. As long as you're willing to submit to the part that says you're also going to corrupt the new world, God's going to have to punish you and put someone else there in your place, then you'll actually be interpreting scripture completely. So you have to come in with a complete interpretation an interpretation that goes all the way through and say, oh, we won't make the mistake that David did. We won't make the mistake that Solomon did. It doesn't we won't make... work. It doesn't work. It can't work. How can you have an interpretation of Scripture that says, oh, people can go into a land and set up a land that's dedicated to God, but then ignore the parts that say, and then they will drift away and create idols and ignore God and take him for granted. <laughs> and ignore the part that says, oh, yeah, by the way, don't do this. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's, it's great that they're trying to copy the Bible, but they're copying the wrong part. Exactly, It's unbearable. The tomb, where we began, the tomb, as I said on Sunday, is metaphoric. It's something hewn out of the rock. So when you come to the empty tomb in Mark, you see that Roman stonecutters have been working. And they've tried to carve something out, but you don't come and find a statue of Jesus or Apollo carved out of the rock. It's hollowed out. So the tomb, even as a tomb, not just that it's hollowed out, but that that's where death is, which is oblivion. This is why they accuse the Antiochians of being nihilistic, because we emphasize the fact that the tomb is empty and that it's death and there's nothing there. But it's not nihilism. It's saying that humans are nihilistic, but what God brings is life-giving. But what he brings is not a statue of Jesus carved by the Romans or the temple made of stone, which Mark critiques earlier in his text and which Jesus threatens to destroy, right? So that's why when you talk about something hewn out of the rock by Joseph of Arimathea and so forth, it clearly, in my mind, within the context of the storyline, 
from Genesis to Revelation is the coalescence of the anti-idolatry school. Now, if you understand that Jesus is the one who carries God's Torah to the nations, in other words, to put it in simple language for our listeners, the New Testament was written to bring the Old Testament to the nations. It is the Old Testament that is the main course. If you understand this movement in Scripture, it's striking that everyone's trying to put Jesus, as Tarazi teaches, everyone is trying to put Jesus into the tomb, verify that he's dead, and seal it shut. Because this is what you do. You build a temple to shut in the teaching, to keep it for you. And suddenly they come to the tomb, they're amazed, and why they're amazed is completely ridiculous because Jesus has been telling them for 16 chapters what's going to happen. Well, 15 chapters, we're now in 16. And they're still amazed because they weren't listening, because they're deaf and dumb like all the people Jesus healed. But they come to the tomb, and it's not Jacob who moved the stone away from the well. It's the father of Jesus who moved the stone away. And where is Jesus? With all due respect, he's busy carrying the Torah to the Gentiles. Why are you standing here? Well, people have to learn from these stories that God is in the place where it seems like he can't be. Jesus is on the cross. Well, this demonstrates very clearly that he can't be the son of God. He's on the cross. He's crucified. He's dead. So obviously he's not the son of God. Well, how, how about the tomb? Well, the tomb is empty. So how can there be anything in this tomb? How can God be in the tomb? It's clearly, clearly empty. These are just two of the ways where scripture critiques our ability to see and to hear what's actually going on. Right. Listen, this has been a great podcast. It's one of those discussions that we could probably do all day, but we have other things to attend to. So, Messiah Qam, Haqqan Qam, Christos Anesti, Christos Anesti, Christos Vos Crece, Christos Vos Crece, and next week we'll try it in Somalia. Thank you. Take care. All right, we'll bye-bye. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.